Anyway, I think that's... Uh, you have anything else you want to add to the JYD jumping off point? No, I think I'm good with JYD, which means it's time, I think, to talk about your bar mitzvah. <laughs> well, what would you like to know? Well, we teased this last week. We did. We did. Um, hold on one second. A swig of water for the bar mitzvah boy right over here. Hold on one sec. Yes. And we both just celebrated our birthdays this week, too, on, on the first night of Hanukkah. It's amazing. Me and Bix have the exact same birthday, different years, but same birthday, and we're from the same hometown. I don't know. I don't know what that means. Yes. <laughs> and I remember once, I think my, I remember once you briefly experimented with making a wrestling newsletter in high school that my sister picked up off the floor and brought home. Is that true? You got that? Yes. Wrestling scoop sheet? <laughs> I don't think that was high school. That was middle school. Okay, it was middle school, but there's no way that was high school. Was that there's the no name? Way I, it, it, I don't remember that being the name, but there's a very good possibility it was because it's three words, and I don't know. I'm the type of person who would do that instead of just wrestling scoops or wrestling sheet. I would do wrestling scoop sheet. That it sounds like something I would have done. When Pro I was wrestling torch, wrestling observer newsletter, wrestling scoop sheet. Yeah, that sounds like something I would have done. I don't remember that being the name, but <laughs> that sounds like something I would have done. Uh, do you have that still? Can you burn it? No. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I guarantee whatever it is, it was just me copying the Observer. <laughs> I guarantee it. Of course it was. Or repeating whatever I heard on Vicious Vincent's World of Wrestling. <laughs> so last week on the show, we talked about Vicious Vincent's World of Wrestling, Vince Russo's 1992 radio show out here on Long Island. And I was a big fan of it. And I was 12 years old. And I contend and I believe – and I intend to maintain this belief that it was actually a fun show to listen to if you were a kid who was into WWF because there wasn't really anything else like that. Even well, if you and st- if you had never heard Pro Wrestling Spotlight. But even if you stumbled upon John Arezzi's show or you somehow woke up for Rich Mancuso's show, which I did many times, and boy, we need to talk about that show. Um, I've, I have not heard it many times. I mean, my, my dad would occasionally try to record it for me. I mean, the joke everyone would make was true where you would call up and be like, hey, where's uh, – you know, where's Bruiser Brody? Oh, he's in Japan. Like everyone you would ask about, he would just say they were they were in Japan. <laughs> but Vicious Vincent's World of Wrestling was a cool show to listen to if you were a kid because John Arezzi's show was more insider and the, the listeners were more uh, adults, I guess is the better word. But Vicious Vincent's show were kids calling up. So you can call up and it was cool. You know, that's where it really became cool to a lot of kids to, to root for the heels because – there were three hosts. It was Vicious Vincent, Skull Von Crush, later Vito LaGrasso, and the Mat Rat. And the Mat Rat was the babyface kind of dorky character. And then Vicious Vincent and Skull were kind of cool because they rooted for the heels. They loved Ric Flair. Right. I mean, it's funny, you know, considering everything that happened. But they're friends now. Yeah, but to get in good with <laughs> Vicious Vincent back then, you would call up and go, woo! And then he would do it back at you. And then, you you know, he would know that you're on the heel team. So, <laughs> so anyway, so... Did you ask your parents or did your mom like broach the subject with you first, like that to book Vicious Vincent and Skull Von Crush at your bar mitzvah? And the Matt Rat. Don't forget the and Matt Rat. Oh, so the Matt Rat was there too. I'm not oh, sure yeah, he was that. there because there was an incident with him and Skull, uh, which we'll get into. Okay. But my mother, you know, like a typical Jewish mother, she took the bar mitzvah on, you know, full blast. You know, there was, you know, a pretty large budget for that. And Jewish women like planning parties to invite, you know, everyone. OK, here's an <laughs> aside for you. What do you remember the name of the of the first of the cousin first cut of the cousin that you had never heard of before where you started where you started where you first asked your parents, who the hell is this person when they started planning? Oh, I mean, I mean, I knew who everyone was, but it was still it was like, no, that was invited or that was con- that they considered inviting. Uh, do you know something I don't know? No, I'm talking about like, – I'm thinking in terms of my bar mitzvah because I remember my I hear my mom start talking about like an Akeem and like my sister and I are like – You have a hell? cousin named Akeem? Uh, apparently, I have some kind of distant relative named Akeem. Bitch. I just said bitch. Excuse me. Bix. <laughs> you just became so much cooler in my eyes. <laughs> you have a cousin named Akeem. Akeem Bixen's fan? I don't think, I don't think he's a Bixen's fan. Oh, I now, all believe- of the Bixen spans that we don't know personally are like either like super orthodox or Hasidic. Akeem Kaleidoscope? No, <laughs> inside joke. <laughs> Some of you may know. I uh, No, I kind of knew who everyone was. I did think it was preposterous, the whole idea of, 
you know, Mima's friends, all of them are invited. Although they were cool. They gave me large, large gifts. Yeah. But you know, everyone from the office was there. Everyone from all over my universe was there. All the PTA parents my mother was in PTA with were there. And so she was really into planning it. And the first thing we did was we needed a theme. And to me, it was obvious. It was like professional wrestling is the one thing I love. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be wrestling. I had a couple of friends the year before who had bar mitzvahs and a year after. And their theme was baseball. And I was always like puzzled about that because I was like, they don't really like baseball. Like I like baseball, but they you can't have a conversation with them about what's going on with their team. It was just they had nothing they really loved. So they kind of just went with something they liked. Well, and also the person they got the centerpiece from the glittery, you know, centerpiece well, had a, could make a baseball. Well, speaking of centerpieces, so we found out from a friend of mine whose bar mitzvah was the year before, his either his cousin or his aunt made the centerpieces. So my mother Mm -hmm. got her information and we drove out to her place. And my mother gave her a heads up. My son likes wrestling. It's going to be a wrestling theme. Was this was this the woman that was called the balloon lady? I don't know who that is. Because I'm just trying to think if somehow if this was the same person we went to. Oh, no, I, I I don't think she was really like on the circuit. I think she kind of just did it as a hobby. OK, so we went there and she knew I liked wrestling and she had gone to some bookstore and purchased every like old wrestling magazine she can get. And a lot of those PWIs had either full pages of she was looking for like entire bodies, like head to toe. Right. And she and she made the coolest centerpieces ever. It was like a wrestling ring with the wrestler standing there. And then above it, it would say his name. I mean, these were the coolest things that she made one for Lex Luger, which I remember that was the first one she showed us, like the sample, because she didn't know who he was. And she went based on the magazine. So she spelled it Lugar, (laughs) L-U-G-A-R, which it was spelled at a a lot of the times in those magazines early on. Yeah. So we saw that. And right away, I was like, yes. So I got her more like I picked out who I wanted. And it was like Ric Flair. Ric Flair was my table. I still have a picture of that centerpiece. Okay, I have to see this. Uh, well, we'll see. Maybe I'll put it on Twitter if, like, enough people, you know, I don't we know. We can put it on enough. Facebook. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see what happens. If enough people express interest, I'll put it on Twitter. Okay. And then you can see the other wrestling posters that were lining my wall that year, too. <laughs> so it's pretty embarrassing when you see a giant Ultimate Warrior poster. Well, I had but, I had one. Mine was uh, Ultimo Dragon. In 92, you had Ultimo Dragon? No, 96. Dra- 96 or 97. Oh, okay. You don't want your bar mitzvah. I thought you were yeah. talking about just like no, you know, no, no. I got a bar mitzvah. No, no, no. I had one made of an Ultima Dragon thing from the mat for magazine. Okay, that's cool. But eventually, I ran out of full body pictures I could find. So some of the tables like that uh, people I really didn't care about, like they got like Max Moon and like, <laughs> different people. But I had Ric Flair, and it was really, really cool. It was gorgeous. And well, you're trying to really get it get over with Russo. So anyway, well. I love Ric Flair. He's my favorite wrestler. I'm kidding. So the first thought we had was my mother said, should we get like some kind of like wrestler there? And I was like, yeah, we should get Ric Flair. So she (laughs) called the WWF and I don't know who she spoke to, but Steve Planamenta. She she, (laughs) maybe Steve Placenta. And she expressed an interest in having Ric Flair. And she was, I mean, we had a pretty big budget for this thing, but she was given some price that for her was just like it was like ten thousand dollars to have Ric Flair come to a bar mitzvah. Let's face it. He would have come there, said something for a minute and then been at the bar drinking and hitting on the dancers. Well, you know know what's fascinating about that, too? When Flair um, left WWE after the retirement to take all those outside gigs, his appearance fee was ten thousand dollars. Was it really? Yes. Well, this was WWE's fee, so I'm sure they were going to take like 90 percent. Well, I'm also I'm also surprised that they actually gave a. I'm not going to say reasonable, but a a quote within the realm of possibility of someone doing it, that they were not just giving her a number to get rid of her. No, no, they gave her a real number and uh, she she can come across like a very serious woman. (laughs) And uh, she said, no, forget it's too much. So she said, who else? And, you know, I didn't know who else. And she's like, what about that show you listen to? How about I get in touch with them? And I was like, all right. You know, I'm not thinking anything of it. Well, like the next thing I know, I come from sc- from school and the mat rats in my living room. <laughs> and like, this is the first time I hear the mat rats, like real voice. He's, you know, talking about stuff. And 
My yeah, mother. Wait, did you know he was, had you met him yet at this point? Like, was this yes. before? So this. All right, because the thing, uh, the the either the bus, whether it was the bus trips with the uh, live show at Whitey Ford's Grand Slam. I went to a bunch of those live shows at Whitey Ford's Grand Slam. I was just thinking about that the other day because you know who used to be at those shows? Oh. Do you remember one of the biggest pieces of shit in, <laughs> that was around back then? Do you remember Boss Hog Calhoun? This would be the fake Haystacks Calhoun who sold those wrestling magazines. The fa- he said he was or the grandson. grandson. Yes, I remember yeah, buying the grandson of Haystacks Calhoun. I remember Boss buying Hog a magazine Calhoun. from him at a Nerezi convention. Yes, he would he show up at these things and talk about how he was about to go into the WWF to feud with the Undertaker. And if you until you knew he was full of shit, it made sense. It's like, wow, he's a he's a really big fat guy. And he's the grandson of Haystacks Calhoun. Of course he would go fight the Undertaker. Well, and, and he had like, the Haystacks Calhoun style, like hair and facial hair. <laughs> too. He looked like Haystacks Calhoun. He's sitting at Whitey Ford's Grand Slam batting cage in, in overalls. I mean, he looked like Haystacks Calhoun. Did he Calhoun. do the Velcro jump? What's the, no, <laughs> no, he didn't do anything except sit in a chair and drink sodas. Um, <laughs> remember back then, uh, Whitey Ford's Grand Slam was a sponsor on Vicious Vincent's show. Maybe one of the only ones. And it was... Go to Whitey Ford's Grand Slam and mention Vicious Vincent and get a free hot dog or a soda. And at the actual live event at uh, Whitey Ford's Grand Slam, I, me and whoever I was talking to, we said, hey, let's go do that. We went up to the counter like, hi, we like a hot dog, Vicious Vincent. And they had no idea you know, what we were talking about. It's their advertisement. And he's actually there doing a live event. And they still had no idea what we were talking about. <laughs> so... I always wonder so how mother, those are supposed to work anyway, by the way, like mention X, Y, Z. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's just such an uncomfortable. So how, you know, yeah. So how about that vicious Vince of world of wrestling? How about, um, <laughs> whatever vicious, vicious Vincent sent me. Woo. You know, like, what are you supposed to say? Well, so, wrestling fans. So my mother somehow got in contact with them and, um, reached some sort of agreement so that we were going to have Vicious Vincent, the Matt Rat, and Skull Von Crush. And Skull Von Crush, excuse me. Later on, he became Skull Von Crush in Memphis, but he was actually just Skull Von Crush. And at the time, he was also doing jobs on WWF TV as Skull Von. No, as Von Crush. That was his name. So it's Wouldn't like when Kevin Von Erich was in Mexico as Von Erich. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Except he wasn't getting squashed by The Undertaker in a minute and a half. Okay. So... <laughs> The next thing I remember from this whole thing was one day, it was like a Sunday. It was, the, it was actually one of the Sundays before a live event. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, Vicious Vincent, Skull Von Cross, and the Matt Ratter in my house eating pasta with us. And my mother said to me, she goes, look, I'm going to get these guys for your bar mitzvah. Don't let them know that you know. So the entire time I had to play dumb. That way, yeah, they you were you had to play dumb about why Vince Russo, the Matt Rat, and Vito LaGrasso <laughs> were in your house. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Hold on one second. Swig of water for Brian from Long Beach. Okay. I'm trying to remember who else was uh I don't know. So that's simulating go- radio, but go ahead. So when we went to the Whitey Ford's Grand Slam, me and my friend actually rode in the car with Vito Lagrasso, Skull Von, Cross. Okay. And I again I can't I can't express enough if you were a kid, Vicious Vincent and Skull Von Cross were so cool together. And Skull Von Cross eventually left the show when they went to one hour on Sundays because he couldn't do the show anymore. And that's kind of when the show dropped off. But he was so cool. And so we go to the live event, and now I know they're coming to my bar mitzvah. And now each week when I call the show, I feel a little more confident. Like, hey, <laughs> Vicious Vince, let's talk about this, you know? And I get to my bar mitzvah, and at some point they pull me in the back, like to the catering area, or not catering, but the kitchen. And standing there in full gimmick is the Matt Rat, Skull Von Cross, and Vicious Vint. Okay, now wait, to get the mental image here. <laughs> what um, what fa- fine South Shore uh, catering hall is this? It was a place called Montana in the fi- in Euclid, I guess it would be. Okay. And I remember it specifically because like three months after my bar mitzvah, the mafia burned it down. And <laughs> when, we, when we went there to like check out, we were checking out different places and we went there, we went in the ba- like uh, the basement office of the guy who ran the place and we told him it was going to be about wrestling. He's like, oh, maybe you're a big Italian guy. He's like, maybe you know some guys who do body wa- bodyguard work for me, the Power Twins. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah. I know who, who were Jewish, are. by the way? Who were Jewish. 
and involved in, you know, with shady characters from Herb Abrams to the owner of Montana. And played said <laughs> shady characters in uh, Ocean's Eleven. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And what was it? Dave Power. And what was his brother's name? Larry. David Larry Power. Yeah, anyone named Larry, you know, right away you think, like, oh, you must be Jewish. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so he says the Power Twins work for him. And we made a deal. And it was a really cool venue. And we went there. And so they pulled me in the kitchen. And they're all back there. And if you haven't seen Vicious Vincent and his Vicious Vincent gimmick, I'll see if I can find my autograph photo where he proclaims I'm his number one fan. And I'll see if I can scan that. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what the Vicious Vincent gimmick attire was. Well, he had like a, a black cowboyish hat with like flames on it okay that's right and then he had like a big black leather jacket with flames he was very into flames very before he burned down promotions he was in the <laughs> fire so, and the mat rat was wearing zubaz pants with a dress shirt and tie and a do-rag to cover his bald head and and, and Vito was in his gear Vito was gear which is nazi color singlet and a like nazi nazi ish black leather jacket and a Nazi-ish cap. I mean, that's the, without having to swatch thing on anything, it's really all it was was Nazi-ish. Now, do you, do you have any relatives or, or p- attendees that were Holocaust survivors? You know, that's a great question. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't think so. I'd hope not. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, although uh, to me, this is what makes me more of a Jew than you or anyone else. I had a showdown with a Nazi wrestler at my bar mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? You know, somehow, somehow that got through and was thought to be a good idea. And so they bring me in the back and now I'm still kayfabing that I don't know these guys are there. And then I'm like, what are you guys doing here? And they're like, you know, happy bar mitzvah. <laughs> and the first thing that happens is they send Russo out and he goes out there and he gets on the microphone. And he goes, hi, everyone. I'm Vicious Vincent from Vicious Vincent's World of Wrestling. And I understand we have a very special occasion here today. And then the mat rat brings me out with his arm around me because, you know, he's like the geeky baby face. So he brings me out and I can't keep a straight face and I'm embarrassed. And I'm in front of, like, in front of my friends and my 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 dad's employees and like the old women my grandmother plays gin with. Like they're just all, just the weirdest <laughs> bunch of people. And here I am with the mat rat who on a good day you'd be embarrassed about being around. You know, again, his voice was, hey, vicious Vince, hot diggity dog. So we're out there. And, and Matt Rat starts yelling at Vicious Vincent something. And then Vicious Vincent says, I have someone here who wants to meet you. And out comes Skull Von Kruss. And he comes out and he kind of just like stares over the crowd and looks over the crowd. And he gets on the mic. And and probably this was probably more mic time than he got until like 1997. <laughs> maybe, okay. Or maybe a little bit. Of, I don't know. I never saw an interview with him except for this for many, many years. And Skull Von Kruss gets on the microphone and before he gets to me, he decides to start walking around the room and making comments to people. Oh boy. Now my dad and several of his friends are pretty big guys. My dad's like six, four. And back then was probably like, I don't know, two eighty, And he certainly liked his wine <laughs> and his whiskey. And so do his friends. And so, so, so Vito's actually trying to get heat. So Vito's trying to get heat, but it's really hard to get heat against guys who are the same size as you, if not bigger, and have had some drinks. <laughs> and he goes over to a few of them, and one of them, you know, is like staring him down, like because he's had a few drinks and he's like ready for action. And another one starts calling him out, like, "You're all talk. We want to see action. We want to see you do something. We want to see action." And he goes over to my dad, and my dad, at you know, I thought my dad first goes, "Let's go!" Arr! You know, and the room popped. My dad got the big baby face reaction. And then my dad proclaimed, I'm not a fighter. I'm a lover. <laughs> and Vito turned around and called him, hey, okay, lover. And he turned back and he said, you guys want action? I'll give you action. And he walked back over to me and he got like in my face and he whispered to me, push me. <laughs> so I pushed him. And now the whole room makes a reaction. And then he comes in and he goes, do it again. So, so I push him again. And now he picks me up over his head. And now he just kind of like walks around with me, parades me around, shows everyone that he's lifting me over his head. And then he puts me down. And then the DJ, the DJ comes on or the MC comes on and tells everyone to go to the tables and enjoy the party. And the music starts playing. So Vince Russo came up with the whole idea. It was like Vince's 
master plan back there. Like, here's what we'll do. It really but there was, was no ending. Well, yeah, there, yeah, it's like every other <laughs> Vince Russo storyline. Yeah, they picked me up and they put me down. So then at my table, I believe we had uh, Skull Von Cross and, and Vince, uh, Vicious Vincent. And then Matt Rowe was at one of the other tables, I think. And then at that some had point, to, so he's just randomly at another table with nobody who knows him. No, no, with kids. Oh, okay. They were all, oh, okay. they were all in the kids section. Okay. Because I had friends who listened to the show. And they were like popping for, you know, here are these guys at this thing. Yeah. You know, in the video, you hear like people in the background going, woo! Like, you know, a couple of the kids knew. I don't what think was... you told me there was a video. No one will ever see it ever. <laughs> ever. Never. Ever. And so then at some point during the party, I don't know what was going on, but like Skull and Matt Rat start like play, like insulting each other. And next thing I know, they're in the middle of the dance floor and the dance floor like clears out. And Skull knocks Matt Rat down. And now he's got him in the position where Matt Rat's on his back and his legs are up. And Skull's holding the legs, like the whole, like, I'm going to kick him in the groin thing. Oh, no. And he's looking around the room and the kids are all going crazy. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> they're all heel fans, obviously. They're cheering for the Nazi. They beat up the Matt Rat. <laughs> and Skull drops an elbow right to the groin. So he, he took an elbow bump on the hard dance floor it wasn't like some ring it was just the middle of the wooden dance floor well I, now i'm getting even more curious about the payoffs which i guess we'll get to and yeah that was that and then that was that and then they hung out and you know this video of vince russo doing the electric slide and hands up okay and- maybe maybe we need to see an edited version of this then <laughs> well you want to see vince russo do hands yes, up i want to see vince russo doing the electric slide and hands up and uh, just edited out everything with you he had a good time. He had a good time. Look, look, let me also say, uh, I, I certainly don't like anything he's done to professional wrestling as a writer or a booker or whatever. But he was always very nice to me. And, you know, I was a big fan of his show back then. And, and nothing could ever take that away. And but with that said, I, I don't like anything he's done since. <laughs> Vicious Vincent to me was the peak of his career. And uh, so then trying to remember what came next. They were there. They were hanging out. And then at some point, me and my friends went downstairs. And while the dancers were upstairs, we went in their bags and we stole one of their panties. And we tried to flush it down the toilet and it wouldn't go. And then we put the wet panties back <laughs> in her. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> typical Jewish chaos. <laughs> Fun and chaos at a bar mitzvah amongst 13-year-olds. Oh, and that's tame compared to some bar mi- one bar mitzvah I went to. Well... So afterwards, I uh, I asked my mom. My mom and me had a very open relationship. My, both my parents did. I grew up in a household where, you know, if I had questions, they answered them. And I think that really benefited me. And I said, how much did you pay these guys? And she paid Vicious Vincent and the Matt Rat and Skull Von Cross $500 each, which without question was the biggest payday any of them have had around wrestling up to that point. And I assume they also got a uh... – meal and access to the open bar <laughs> well they got a meal and access to the open bar i don't remember any of them drinking to be honest they may have but they certainly had a meal so they were professional <laughs> they were they were it was it was it was cool you know imagine if you were a fan of a radio show or a television show and all of a sudden the stars of the show were at your bar mitzvah you know you're a kid and it's exciting it was fun you had no idea right you didn't realize that wgbb wasn't real radio yet <laughs> no, I thought it was real radio. I mean, other than WFAN, it was all, you know, it was the only radio I really knew at that time. Right. I, I mean, was, I kid, but it's, you know, it was all, it's one of those stations that was all time buys. Right. But I, I certainly didn't realize that back then. Right. So, I mean, is there anything else to talk about with this or? Uh... I don't know. <laughs> I'm well, I, what, what did Jim Cornette think the first time you ever told him about this? You know, I don't know. I was, I was thinking that recently. I was like. I know I told him about it, but I can't remember his reaction because I probably was. Uh, Jesus we, Christ, Brian. We were probably at a bar. I so can't I, do the cornet voice, but all I can think of is just like him exclaiming like, Jesus Christ, Brian. Yeah, your, your Jim Cornette voice sounds like Jim Ross's awful Terry Funk somehow. <laughs> That's I barely didn't even I didn't even try. I was just like, <laughs> I know I'm not going to do this because could you hey, imagine the damage? Hey, you egg sucking dog. That's every time he talks about Terry Funk, that's what he does. Hey, you egg sucking dog, slow it down. Just that's more like up. droopy than Terry Funk. Slow it down. Yeah, I mean his his impression is the worst. It is absolutely the worst. Um, I hope he gets his Twitter back though. Who's Jim? Who, Jr. Who, Jr. That Jim. Who took his Twitter? He it got hacked, and right now it's uh it's it's temporarily gone. I guess temporarily. Was it Tony Schiavone? 
<laughs> Not that I know. It was it was an angry uh, British football fan or something. Br- <laughs> Brit- foot, a, it, soccer football. Oh, okay. Well, but yeah, that's the bar mitzvah story. The best that I uh, remember off the top of my head. Like I said, if enough people want to see it, I'll post the centerpiece of uh, Ric Flair that was on my table and maybe the Vicious Vincent autograph photo I have somewhere. So was this photo, did he have professionally done 8 by 10s Oh, yeah, my family made them because my family was in the printing. (laughs) So going into the bar mitzvah, we wanted things for him to sign for people. So we made uh, the photos for him and the Matt Rat. And, I mean, it was what they they ended up using going forward after that, although his show really didn't last too much longer. It was only on a few more months. But, yeah, my family printed those for him. Wow. Because we needed something. We needed something for him to sign. He didn't have anything. He had photos, but he didn't have anything printed out. And my family owned the largest commercial printing company in New York City, so it was pretty easy to do. Now, One time, years yeah. later, one time, uh, slightly off topic, we'll return to it. Uh, I was at some convention with Georgie Amicropoulos. Uh, not a wrestling convention, just like a, you know, like a general collectibles memorabilia yeah. collection uh, convention. excuse me. And every now and then there'd be wrestling people there. Missy Hyatt was there. And I got to talking to her and – she was letting me know that she wanted to do a calendar. I was like, oh, you should call my dad and uh, you know, talk to him. We're in the printing business. We can help you out if you know what you're doing. She said, oh, great. And he, she called him up like a uh, – Wait. So is this the convention I was talking about that you didn't realize was in a Reggie co- convention? No, no, no. Or, this or was like had in, the Reggie affiliation? No, this was in New Jersey somewhere. Okay. Chiller Theater and, or something maybe? It wasn't Chiller Theater. It was just some like card convention. It was okay. like cards and like you know Beatles stuff and it was, it was like a weird con- little convention. Yeah. It was cool. And she called my dad and I asked my dad, I was like, well, what happened? Did you make a deal? Because I'm thinking, I'll get free Missy Hyatt calendars. I'll be the greatest. And he's like, yeah, she really didn't know what the hell she wanted or what she was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so the other, the other story with my dad, now I'm going to tell my stories about my dad because I know he doesn't listen, is uh, I was at a convention at Hofstra in 94, I think. Could have been 95. I think it was 94. And Bret Hart was there. And I started talking to Brett on his way out. And I was like, hey, you know, I'm from Long Beach. And he goes, oh, that's where my parents, you know, met. That's where my mother's from. So I knew I had an easy connection there. Right. And I said, you know, I just was watching footage. I got a 1979 Georgia with your on it. And he's like, oh, I would really love to see that. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, let me know how I can get it to you. And he said, okay, give me your phone number. I said, okay, here you go. You know, he was one of my favorite wrestlers. So I gave it to him. And I went home and I sat by the phone just waiting for Brett to call. And he never called. And then the next day I went to school. And when I came home, there was something written on like a pad next to my bed. And it was just this ad. It was like Bret Hart, care of Marcy whatever, Engelstein. Care of Marcy Engelstein. And then it was this Canadian address that my dad clearly just jotted something down. I don't know what he wrote. He didn't remember what he wrote. So he wasn't, he was like, I don't know. I just wrote what she told me. But when I, as soon as I went to school, my dad, my dad answered my phone. And it was Bret Hart. Like, hey. <laughs> oh, it was Bret. It was Bret. It wasn't oh, yeah. Marcy. No, no, no. It was Bret. He said, this is where you can get me stuff. And he gave us Marcy's address. Did no, So, and the address, though, you couldn't figure it out. So you never sent it. It was, you know, not that Canadian addresses are so difficult, but it was just. Well, the was, zip codes are a little weird. It was the zip code. It was everything. It was just, I don't know what my dad wrote. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but yeah. So, yeah, good times. And yeah. the bar mitzvah is in Vince Russo's book. I mean, not in detail, but it is. He, he just mentions like you went to a fan's bar mitzvah. Yes. Yeah. Actually, yeah, I'm trying to remember if he says it was a paid booking or not. If he said if he refers to it as one. I think he does say that we, we did. We, we worked a kid's bar mitzvah. Yeah. Something like that. So that was mine. Little little did he know that a few years later, I'd be buddies with Cornette at fan week. You know? <laughs> yeah. Two years later. Yeah, Less yeah. than two years later. That's right. Well, uh, Cornette didn't know hair no hide of him, nor hide of him at that point. That's right. That's right. Although they, they got along at first. You know, when I went on the Vicious Vincent bus trip to Halloween Havoc 92 in Philadelphia, mm-hmm. when we were leaving the arena, you know, we had our crew getting ready to go on our bus. And all of a sudden you just start hearing this chant, Russo sucks, Russo <laughs> sucks. And we're all looking around and it was John Arezian, like his whole bus trip. And we, I didn't know anything about the feud or anything, but it was the first time I ever heard Russo sucks chanted and it was outside the arena and he wasn't, you know, he was just a radio show host. 
This has been very confusing, too, because you were in Philly. Right. You were in, in New York. You were in Philly, and all of a sudden, you're so In stuck. Philly, at that awful Halloween having pay-per-view. The highlight of it for me was I got a Steiner Brothers shirt, and they weren't even on the show. Do you still have it? Yes. Those WCW shirts go for a lot of money. Yeah, I don't know what kind of condition it's in, but I still well, have it. I guess. But anyway. Yeah, so speaking of people who love Vince Russo, uh, I did not listen.